Hey, we've been reading Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, it's a medieval romance written in the 1400s uh, near Wales, and uh, it's, it's sort of a Christmas story. Uh, so far, we haven't done a whole lot aside from sort of introduce a story and sort of see King Arthur's court and the, the splendor and the opulence and the wealth that they've got going on. Uh, at the very tail end of last time, the Green Knight arrived. I mean, this is called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, it sort of tells you just in the title that Sir Gawain is your protagonist and the Green Knight is your antagonist. Um, and the Green Knight showed up, but I didn't do any analysis of him and what was going on with him. And I definitely want to do that here now. So um, let, me, let me start that. Uh, we're going to start at line 130 and uh, go from there. I've nothing more to tell of their feasting. Any fool knows with what splendor they would fed. And to send the prince to his dinner, I mean the king there, um, a different sound approach. The trumpets and pipes were barely still. The drums silent. The first dishes set in place when a ghastly knight sprang through the door. Huge, taller than men stand, so square and so thick from neck to knee, Thighs so broad around, legs so long, he seemed half an ogre. A giant, but clearly the biggest creature in the world, and the fairest, the gayest for his size, as thin in the waist, as flat in the belly, as his back and chest were grim and immense, from cheek to chin fine and elegant, with an easy grace, and stunning the court with the color of his race, a fiery snorting fellow. And his hands were green, and his face... All right, so we've established that he's green. Um, but one of the key fa factors of this guy, aside from the fact that he's green and, and what that might mean symbolically, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, is that he's he's what we call um, ambiguous. You, maybe you've heard the word before, ambiguous. It means you can't tell. Uh, in this case, we can't tell whether he's good or evil. We don't know whether he's, you know, like... Um, a good guy or a bad guy. And you can see that from the description. Let's go back through it carefully and look at the particular words that are used here and, and what they mean. Um, you know, first impression is he's ghastly. Uh, that's a scary word. Ghastly is is sort of terrifying. A ghast is a, an, a this creepy undead sort of a image. Um, so he's, he's ghastly knight, uh, but he's a knight. You know, like, that's the highest class, that's the warrior class. All, all of these guys here are knights, so he's sort of in a company of people that he belongs with. Um, he's huge, taller than men, stand so square and thick from neck to knee, thighs so broad around, legs so long, he seemed half an ogre, a giant. So um, we get this image of his intensely large stature and strength. The guy is like eight feet tall. Um, he's half a giant or an ogre. Those are negative statements, but half. You know, so look at the very next couple of lines. Clearly the biggest creature in the world, still sort of intimidating, scary. But then, and the fairest? Fair is a word we use to describe, you know, attractive things like a fair maiden. The gayest for his size. Gay back then just meant happy. So this guy comes in, he's like, ah, ha, ha. you know, like he's a happy guy. Um, as thin in the waist, as flat in the belly as his back and chest were grim and immense. So he's well proportioned. He's not proportioned like a monster. He's proportioned like a man. He's got a, you know, the the an eight foot body, but it's like the body of uh, Chris Emsworth, the guy who plays Thor, um, you know. And so uh, then it says uh, his chest was grim. That's a negative word and immense. Uh, but his cheek and chin fine and elegant. He's also got an easy grace. He's graceful, uh, but he's he's green, you know. So like all of these things make it hard to know whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. And his armor and his shirt were green, all green, a short, tight tunic worn close and a merry mantle sewn in with fur that rippled as he rode, trimmed rich at the edges with bright white ermine, both his mantle and the hood thrown low on his back below his flowing hair and his smoothed web stockings stretched taut on his legs were green, all striped with embroidered silk and shining spurs were gold. And he wore no shoes, rode peacefully into that prince's court. Pause again more ambiguity about this guy. You know, aside from the green of his, his color, uh, everything he seems to have is green. His armor, he's wearing armor. Armor is something that only rich people can afford. Um, but it's also something that you wear to battle. And his shirt were green, all green. A short, tight tunic. He wears his, his clothes tight to show off his, his muscular body or whatever. It's like a muscle shirt. Um, worn close. He has a mantle sewn in with fur that rippled as he rode. Uh, bright white ermine. That ermine is like a white weasel. Um, it's the, the fur that you see around a king's cape on a deck of cards. 
And, um, you know, that that's pretty uh, expensive stuff, the most expensive in the land. So this says not only is this guy, you know, a member of, of the knightly class, he's called the Green Knight, but he's a member of the nobility. Um, he's got the kind of stuff that only nobility can afford. He's ultra rich. Uh, and I think that's that's key. Um, you know, uh, also, you know, this is a Christmas story. And uh, I don't know if anybody is noticing some similarities here, but um, and, and, and maybe worth noting that one of the key uh, factors of Santa Claus is that he has that ermine trim on his outfit, that white uh, fur. Um, yeah, there's maybe a, an interesting correlation. This is before Santa Claus was a real big thing, uh, but it's certainly, you know, seasonally appropriate, with a, with a, except this guy's green instead of red. But we'll continue to look at that weird sort of Santa Claus correlation as we go. Um, let's see. Um, his mantle and hood thrown low on his back is below his flowing hair and his smooth web stockings. Uh, you know, stockings were, were the fashion then, um, but his stockings are like webbed uh, and the, the threads are gold, right? So again, more wealth, more riches. Um, and why would the author take so much time to introduce every detail of this night if those details didn't matter, right? If the, if the author's going to take a couple pages to introduce the character and give you all these details, as a reader, it's important that you pay attention to them. Um, and he's wearing spurs, you know, like, and silk. Silk is expensive. It comes from all the way across, you know, in China and has to get all the way over here. So this guy's, you know, connected. Um, he's wearing he's wearing the wealthiest equipment, uh, but he's not wearing shoes. So on one hand, you know, like he's got armor on, which is something symbolizing warfare. But on the other hand, he's not wearing shoes, which at the time was a symbol of peace. It was something that a member of the clergy would do, not wear shoes to show, you know, you know, peaceful intent. Nobody goes into battle without shoes on. So, you know, there's that as well. Um, where was I? Uh, and he wore no shoes, rode peacefully into that prince's court. Everything about him was an elegant green, from the colored bands on his belt to the jewels set in his clothes and his saddle woven around with silk designs. Birds and butterflies flew in that embroidery, beautifully worked and fine, decorated in green and with gold scattered across them. All right, we're going to pause again. Um, birds and butterflies flew in that embroidery. He has this beautifully embroidered um, shirt that has images of birds and butterflies in it. Um, and this is the first sense of real magic about this guy. The the birds and butterflies that are sewn or, or designed into his clothes are flapping their wings and flying from place to place on his outfit, uh, which, you know, would, would set you back, I think, if you were looking at it and you you didn't expect it. Um, but we're starting to be able to see the symbolism of this character. Um, he's green, and green, um, you know, nowadays we tie it to money or envy. Uh, it's tied to money because American currency is green. So that's out. There was no American currency back when this was written. Um, it's tied to envy because of a Shakespeare play called Othello that said jealousy was the green-eyed monster. Uh, and that was not something that was associated in the medieval times. In the medieval times, green was primarily associated with nature. Um, and you can see that his outfit has birds and butterflies on it, and, and that makes him associated with nature. And I would also put out there that we have a little bit of a change in the view of nature in the Middle Ages. Uh, in the Anglo-Saxon times, nature was straight evil and wanted to kill you. Um, in the medieval times, you know, as people got better at, at surviving and they were less threatened by nature, nature became more ambivalent. Um, you know, nature's beautiful, uh, there are these there are these beautiful scenes and these moments that you can have out in nature, but nature is also deadly. Uh, and so, you know, maybe the Green Knight represents that ambivalence that nature has as well. His horse's armor was enameled, and the saddle and its straps and the bit and its teeth were green, and the stirrups for that knight's feet were green, and his saddle horn and the shining leather hung from the saddle, glittering and gleaming with green stones. And his stallion, too, is green as the rider, a huge horse headstrong, decisive, and quick, but caught up by his hand's touch on the bridle. So we've got, you know, a green horse and a green rider. We're, we're going out of our way to make sure that literally everything about this guy is green. Um, but the horse itself is huge. It's a, it's a very impressive horse. It would have to be to, to carry an eight foot tall guy. Um, his clothes and his armor were glorious, this green knight. That's a positive word. Um, he's glorious. His hair, the color of his horse, and waving down his shoulders, 
A beard as thick as a bramble bush grew from his chin and fell in front as far as the hair and back. Hair and beard cut at the elbow like a king's hooded cape, enclosing his neck and half his arms. Um, so a couple of things here. This guy's got um, hair that is so long and elegant, it looks like a king's hooded cape. That's a nice simile that's positive. But he's got a beard that's like a bramble bush. That's a nature image, and it's sort of negative, right? Um, and and also, you know, like this is a time period when knights really didn't have those big beards anymore. They had little goatees and they were well groomed. And this guy looks very Anglo-Saxon in comparison to the kind of knights that you would expect to see in King Arthur's court. So there's an element to him that is um, sort of barbaric or, or ancient. Uh, and I think, you know, that would have struck readers at the time as well. Um, let's see. And, and then we get this enormous description of his horse's mane. Um, his horse's mane hung long, combed and curled, braided strand for strand, with a gold thread, a strand of green hair, another of gold, and his forelock and his tail were braided to match, bound in place with green band, dotted with precious stones, the length of that flowing tail, then laced with an elaborate knot and strung with dozens of bright gold bells that rang as he rode, and rider and horse stranger than anything seen on earth before that day. Okay, so the horse has its, I mean, anybody who's an equestrian, you've seen horses that are probably um, made up or improved to, to look beautiful. They comb all the hair over one side, and so the horse's whole mane is combed over to one side, and then they threaded the green hair of the horse with gold thread, uh, and so his hair glitters, and he's got the forelock, like that's a My Little Pony thing that goes up between the ears and comes down in front. Uh, so it's a very well-groomed horse, um, but they also sewed gemstones into the horse's hair so it glitters and they put a, like a thong through there with with golden bells dangling from it so he jingles jingle bells you know like a like a christmas sleigh with with reindeer um he's jingling everywhere he goes now this translation doesn't say this but two other translations that i've read indicate that not only is the horse's hair done this way but that the green knight's beard is done this way so the green knight's beard would have gemstones and jingle bells in it and he would be he would just be a loud jovial fellow um which i think is is interesting um look at this quatrain though he seemed to glow like lightning they say who were there, who could know the force of his blow. So on the one hand, we get this very pleasant image of the gemstones and the jingling bells and, you know, like all the finery that this guy's wearing. But he's also got biceps like beer barrels. And, uh, you know, if he punched you, say, in the head, it would be like being struck by lightning. Chow, boom, there'd just be like a smoking hole where your head was. Uh, and so, again, the, the ambivalence. He's, he's both beautiful and incredibly dangerous. Um, and yet he wore no helmet, no male shirt, no neck armor, nothing against steel or arrow, nor carried a shield, nor swung a spear. He only had a branch of holly in one hand, holly that grows greenest when the woods are bare, and an axe in the other. Monstrous, huge, a vicious weapon, four feet wide, hammered of green steel and of gold, with a polished blade, a bright cutting edge, and long and stropped like a razor, ready to shear, and his hand held it by a thick staff, strong and straight, and wound round with iron at the end. It goes on. Uh, there's a lot of description of this axe. Maybe this axe is important. Maybe there's something uh, symbolically uh, relevant about the axe. But let's let's go back and look at this description. Sorry, it's getting uncomfortable in the car here. Um, so he doesn't wear a helmet. He doesn't wear a male shirt or neck armor. That means it seems like he comes in peace. Nothing against steel or arrow. He doesn't carry a shield. He doesn't have a spear. And he has a holly branch in one hand. Well, holly is a symbol of the holidays. There was holidays. You hear it? Holly day, holiday. Uh, it goes back to this old um, pagan holiday called Yule. Um, and you know what, maybe it's worth stopping and talking about Yule here um, at this point. So anyway, basically Yule was this, this pagan holiday where um, it was sort of a, a celebration of the new year, of the approaching spring, right? And so what would happen is um, the, the pagans, particularly in this case, the people who, who were uh, the Celts, the, the worshippers of Druids, but also the people um, who were the Norse often celebrated Yule as well. Anyway, they would go out um, and they would cut down evergreen trees and holly bushes, and they would bring them either inside or they would decorate a clearing that was an oak tree clearing, and they'd tie all this greenery up everywhere so it looked like spring. Uh, it takes you back to one of the early lines in this poem, which is it was springtime in Camelot in the Christmas snow. 
you know, they try and make it seem spring-like by using evergreen branches and evergreen trees. And that's, that's echoed by our Christmas trees today. Um, they, they harken back to um, Yule. And so then there would be a feast and they would bring this giant log called a Yule log and they build a giant bonfire and they put this huge log in the middle and they would drink and feast. Um, the, the primary feast was a boar, which is echoed by our Christmas ham. And while this Yule log burned, the feast would last and they would exchange presents and, you know, like all this kind of stuff. Um, it was also a time of peace on earth. Anybody who had warring clans, the clans were forbidden uh, by religion and by law from attacking each other during the Yuletide, during the, the holiday season. Um, and people could go visit their friends and family in warring clans and, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. Um, but they would have this party that lasted while the Yule log burned. And when the Yule log burned down, so the goal was to get the biggest log you could and put it in the middle of the bonfire. And, and you know, like you'd have to burn the whole thing up. And that was the end of the celebration. However, in, in Celtic tradition, there was also a secondary element to the celebration. And that's definitely what this green knight is symbolizing. Um, they had this this thing called the Sun King, um, in which, um, you know, like the old year is dying and the new year is born. And so um, every year they'd, they'd take somebody, um, you know, like a slave or, or somebody, and they'd inaugurate him the Sun King, and he'd be king for a year, essentially. Um, now, he wasn't really king. It was sort of a religious position, but he would he would have a great year and be fed and treated beautifully. But the next year, um, on New Year's Eve, they would behead him with a giant axe, cut his head off, and then inaugurate the new Sun King for the next year. And it was sort of a sacrifice, um, you know, for, for a good year. Um, we know about this because it was written down by historians, but those historians uh, saw the practice at a later stage where they weren't actually killing people. They were, they were chopping the head off sort of a, an effigy or a, um, you know, a straw man, but they think that it had its roots in an actual blood sacrifice um, thing. But this guy comes in, right? And, and he's got a holly bow in one hand, which represents peace and peace on earth in the holidays. But what's in his other hand? An axe. And they take a long time describing this axe. Um, in fact, let's, let's take a look at that. An axe in the other monstrous. Okay, so it's a huge axe. A vicious weapon four feet wide. Okay, wait a second. It's got a blade four feet long. What kind of an axe has a blade four feet long? Four is a numerological number representing um, the life cycle, nature, um, earth, you know, those kinds of things that maybe might be associated with the Green Knight. But a blade four feet long might be more like, I don't know, a scythe, like the blade of death than it is like an axe. Um, we'll hold on to that thought and think about it as, as this goes on. Um, a vicious weapon, four feet wide, hammered of green steel and of gold with a polished blade, a bright cutting edge and long and stropped like a razor. This thing is so sharp that you could shave with it. You, if you pulled a hair off your head, you could split the hair on the sharp blade of the axe. Um, ready to shear, and his hand held it by a thick staff, strong and straight, and wound round with iron. So this is all iron, you know, like um, images and, and powerful imagery. Uh, but then even the axe is ambiguous. It was carved with lovely green symbols and designs and hung by a strap run through the head and down the handle, looped around and tied with delicate tassels and embroidered buttons, green and rich. So the axe itself looks horrifying, but it's also got like these cute little like tassels hanging off of it and all of this, this little detail. It's very much like the Green Knight himself. This knight stalked in the door and through the hall to Arthur's high table, afraid of no one, greeting no one, ignoring them all. Uh, that's kind of rude. I mean, imagine, first off, we're at a giant Christmas feast, and this guy comes riding in on a horse. That would be like if we had some sort of a Christmas feast uh, going somewhere, and some guy just drove in on a Harley Davidson. This is rude. This is Arthur's great hall. He rides his horse in, and then he ignores everyone and rides straight through the feast, straight up to the high table without introducing himself, without any of that kind of thing. So we see the Green Knight here as as sort of scaring them all and impressive uh, and wealthy and rich and beautiful and terrifying and rude. Um, let's see, uh, greeting no one, ignoring them all. And when he spoke, where, he said, is the Lord of this company? I'd like to see him in person and exchange some words. He stared at the knights, rolling his eyes up and down, then stopped and squinted, hunting the knight of noblest renown. So he like, he's got his eyes wide. He's searching the hall. I mean, rolling his eyes around and they themselves sat and stared, wondering bewildered what it meant that a knight and his horse could have such a color, could grow as green as grass or greener. 
and glow brighter than emerald enamel and gold. And those who were standing watched and walked carefully near him, not knowing what he'd do. They'd all seen wonders, but nothing like this. And some said he was witchcraft, a phantom, and were afraid to answer him, and then gasped at his voice and trembled, sitting motionless in that noble hall, silent as stones, as corpses. All speech was swept away as if sleep had dropped from the sky, but some surely stopped their tongues in courtesy to do honor to Arthur, whose words should come first. So we get an image of everybody in the hall silent uh, and terrified uh, or in awe and wonder at, at the green knight, um, who's greener than grass. That's an interesting or starts out as a simile and gets, gets more intense. Um, also, uh, you know, they're silent as corpses. I, I think that's an interesting simile, too. So we got some similes in here uh, comparing various people to things. Um, anyway, I, I, one other thing I, I want to talk about is, is that it said um, they'd all seen wonders, but nothing like this. These are the knights of King Arthur's court. They fight dragons and giants and monsters and go on quests, and they've never seen anything anything like this. It'd be like saying an astronaut had never seen anything like this. I mean, these are the these are the most adventurous guys in the world. Um, anyway, and Arthur stood watching the strange arrival. Gotta be able to send this on. And greeted him gravely, for he knew nothing of fear. So Arthur's not scared. And said, Sir, you are welcome in my house, for I am Arthur, and I rule this court. Step down from your horse and stay. Let me pray you. And whatever you've come for can be talked of afterward. So Arthur's like, hey, we're having a feast. Why don't you join us? He's very courteous. He's very kind. And, and that comes across uh, as well. No, God help me, said the green man. I have no interest in lingering here. Yet you and your court are so famous, prince. And your castle and your knights are praised so widely. The proudest, the boldest soldiers to sit on a horse, the bravest and best of men, eager to compete in noble games. And your courtesy is told in such terms that I came to see if these tales were true. You can surely tell by this branch here in my hand that I've come in peace, not seeking, not giving offense. Had I ridden with my men intending to fight, I've a helmet and a mail shirt at home, and a shield and a sharp spear shining bright, and other weapons meant for war. I intend no war. What I wear is in peace. And if Arthur is as brave as his fame, in the name of this Christmas season, you'll grant me the sport I've come for. Pause. This is a really important moment um, here, and it's worth analyzing. The Green Knight is offering a challenge. I mean, it's very clearly worded here as a challenge. Um, so, you know, Arthur's like, you want to stay for dinner? And the Green Knight's like, no, God help me. I have no interest in lingering here. I like that word lingering. It makes it sound like he really is a phantom, like there's something going on there where he, he feels like um, he doesn't belong. He's not part of this world. And that's, that's interesting. Um, but he says, you you know, the, the Knights of the Round Table are so famous. Everybody talks about them. Um, they're praised so widely. And he lists some things. The proudest, the boldest soldiers to sit on a horse. The bravest and the best of men. So they're proud, they're bold, they're brave. Um, they're the best men. Their courtesy is told in such terms. Now, that courtesy is an interesting translation. Uh, chivalry uh, might be a better word there. Um, your chivalry is told in such terms that I came to see if these tales were true. You can surely tell by this branch here in my hand, he waves the holly branch, right, that I've come in peace. Um, it, he's like, I've got an army. I've got armor. I could come and kill you, uh, but I'm not here to kill you. I've come in peace. Um, and then he says... In the name of this Christmas season, invoking Christmas, invoking the Christian holiday, um, I've come for sport. You know, I've come to play a Christmas game. Let's play a Christmas game. You know, and that's the challenge. Now, whatever this game is, whatever this challenge is, is going to test, and I think this is very clear, the chivalry, the bravery, the courtesy, um, the skill, uh, the nobility, you name it, of King Arthur's Knights, of the round table. And Arthur replied, Your wish is done, sir. If you've come to fight, we'll fight and not run, sir. No, not fighting. Believe me, prince. These benches are filled with beardless infants wearing my armor, riding to war. There's no muscle in this hall to match me. 
It's a game I want to play, a Christmas sport for the season. But he just insulted all the knights of King Arthur's court. Uh, he looks around, he says, these are all beardless infants compared to me. In other words, it, you know, me killing one of your knights would be as easy as me killing a baby. You just pick it up and bam, knock its head on the ground. It's dead, right? Like that. Sorry for the offensiveness of that. But that's essentially what he's saying. It would have offended everybody in the room. Um, but this is also, I think, a commentary. The author is commenting on how um, there's a shift going on in England in the 1400s. We're moving, it's toward the end of the medieval period, and we're moving toward the Renaissance, which officially starts in 1585, so like 180 years from now. But the transition that happens with the people in power is they started out as knights. They started out as fighters who actually you know, went into battle and fought for their king. Um, they had, you know, big old beards, you know, like you would imagine in Beowulf and, and were grim and dangerous fellows, much like this, this green knight. But by the time the story was written, a little bit of historical context, those knights were changing into politicians. They didn't go and fight themselves. They sent men to fight for them. Um, you know, they, they hired armies or they, they recruited armies and had generals and they didn't do the actual fighting themselves. They had little goatees. They were beardless infants compared to the old warriors. So it's like sort of a statement about um, people and during the time when this was written compared to people a long time ago who maybe the Green Knight represents. But he says he wants to play a game. He wants to play a Christmas sport. This is what he says. Your court sings of its daring. If they'll dare it, if any of these eager knights rise so boldly, so fierce, so wild, and give a blow and take a blow, I'll offer this noble axe, and I'll let them swing its weight as they like, and I'll sit without armor and invite them to strike as they please. Anyone with the nerve to try it, take this axe. Here, hurry, I'm waiting. Take it and keep it my gift forever, and give me a well-aimed stroke and agree to accept another in payment when my turn arrives, but not now. A year and a day will be time enough. So is anyone able to rise? So he offers the challenge, the game. He's going to give the axe to whoever is going to accept the challenge. That person gets to swing at him. One swing with the axe. He's not going to try and defend himself. He's not wearing any armor. You just get to swing the axe at him. And uh, if he survives, he gets a year to recover, and then he gets to swing the axe at you. It's like that game where you punch each other in the arm as hard as you can, um, except you're playing it with an axe. This is, a, this is a terrifying game, right? Like, I guess if you kill him on the first swing, problem solved, you don't have to worry about it anymore. But if somehow he survives, then you know in a year you're going to go and die, because this guy's eight feet tall with muscles like beer barrels. But... Let's see how, how Arthur's court reacts to this challenge. Certainly, this is a test of bravery. Um, if he'd stunned them at first, they sat stiller now. All who followed Arthur, noble and knave, that knight swiveled in his saddle, his eyes rolling fierce and red. Wait, hold up, he's got red eyes? He's got green skin? Everything about him is green, but he's got red eyes? Like, that's a little evil, maybe? Um, it's like Holly, though. Holly is green with the red berries. There's like a Christmas element to that. That's, you know, that's worth thinking about. Um, and he wrinkled his bristling brows, gleaming green, and switched his beard from side to side. And no one rose. And he reared like a lord and yelped and laughed and said, Ha ha! Is this Arthur's house hailed across the world, that fabled court? Wherever have your conquests gone to, and your pride? Where is your anger and those awesome boasts? And now the round table's fame and its feasting are done, thrown down at the sound of one man's words. And you sit there shaking at words! Um, and he laughed so loud that Arthur winced, his face his fair face flooded hot with shame, and his cheeks, he flared as angry as wind, and all his people burned. Right, so uh, the Green Knight has offered this challenge, and nobody accepted it. They've all sort of shrunk back from this idea. I mean, like, who wants to play this game? Let's be honest. But nobody accepted the challenge, and he laughs in their face. You're supposed to be so brave. You're supposed to be so, so great, and you've all scared off. All I've done is talk, and you're a bunch of cowards. Um, and the bold king strode toward the green knight. By God, fellow, this is foolish stuff, but you've asked for folly, and folly you'll get. No one's afraid of your nonsense. For God's sake, give me your axe. I'll grant your request. So the king's going to take the challenge. He's so ashamed that none of his knights are stepping up that he himself steps up and goes to, to take the axe from the, the green knight. 
Uh, and he does. I like the line there. Uh, you've asked for folly and folly is what you get. This is a stupid game, but if you want to play your stupid game, I'll play it. I'll kill you. Right. Light and fast, he ran and clasps the Green Knight's hand, and proudly the Green Man dismounts, and Arthur lifts the axe and whips it about, gripping it firm in his fists, grim, determined. That haughty knight stood huge at his side, a head and more the tallest in the hall, stroking his beard, his face set and still. He quietly pulled down his coat, as indifferent to Arthur's swishing axe, as if the king were a waiter carrying wine. So the Green Knight seems completely unconcerned about the about King Arthur testing out this axe, and he gets gets one swing at the Green Knight with his axe, sharp enough to split a hair four feet long. Um, now we, for the first time, introduce our protagonist, Sir Gawain. Gawain was seated next. Now, you could call it Ga Gawain. I've heard it both ways. The British refer to him as Gawain, and most Americans sort of say Gawain, which sounds like, you know, I don't know, a rapper, little Gawain. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, you know, whatever. Uh, Gawain was seated near the Queen. He leaned forward. Hear me, my lord. Let this challenge be mine. Then Gawain bowed to the king. Release me, my liege, from this bench, and let me come to you. Permit me to rise without discourtesy and without displeasing your queen. Let me come to counsel you here in your noble court. It seems wrong. Everyone knows how wrong. When a challenge like this rings through your hall, to take it yourself, though your spirit longs for battle, think of your bold knights bursting to fight, as ready and willing as men can be, defer to their needs. And I am the slightest, the dullest of them, my life the least, my death no loss, my only worth is you, my royal uncle, and all my virtue is through you, and this foolish business fits my station, not yours. Let me play this green man's game. If I ask too boldly, may this court declare me at fault. And the knights whispered, buzzed, then all in a voice said it was for Gawain. The king should halt. Hey, sorry about um, stopping here and there and, and looking like I'm staring off into space. My, my son's at a swim meet right now. Um, you know, it's all virtual, sort of like it's just his swim team that is that is competing and, and they're doing it virtually. But uh, I am waiting to pick him up and recording this in the car. Uh, but I've got him on my phone um, because they're, they're like live streaming it. And so I just keep looking over there and making sure I don't miss his event. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to keep recording this for you. Um, so, you know, the Green Knight offers this this challenge and, and King Arthur takes it up. But then Gawain, you know, he offers to take it for the king because he doesn't want his king to die. And this is kind of, um, you know, we, we get the first taste of Gawain as a person and his chivalry when we look at the speech that he makes. He says, um, let this challenge be mine, but he's not trying to steal the glory from King Arthur. It's very much like Beowulf talking to Hrothgar. Um, Gawain bowed to his king. He says, release me, my liege, from this bench. So he asked for permission from his king to step up and let me come to you. Permit me to rise without discourtesy. He doesn't want to be discourteous. That's one of our tenets of chivalry to the queen who is sitting next to him. He says, let me come to counsel you here in your noble court. Then he says it seems wrong, and he stresses everybody knows how, how wrong. He's calling out all the other knights who didn't take up the challenge ahead of time. When a challenge like this rings through your hall to take it yourself, though your spirit longs for battle. He's like, yeah, I know you're an old king, and, and you want to be young, and you want to fight, and you want to take these challenges, right? Um, so he's validating King Arthur's manliness, his, his knightliness. Uh, think of your bold knights um you know bursting to fight as ready and willing as men can be defer to their needs he's like you know you got these younger men who need to make a name for themselves and you're, you're taking this challenge away from them i'm one of them um you know it's it's a need for me be kind to me and let me take this challenge for you very much like beowulf and rothgar uh you know uh I just lost my spot. Needs. Uh, and I am the slightest, the dullest of them all. Remember, humility is one of the tenets of knighthood, very much opposed to Beowulf. Beowulf would have been like, oh, I'm so awesome. I drove five great giants into chains. In contrast, times have changed. Gawain says, I am the slightest and the dullest of the knights. He's not. He's the king's nephew. He's a famous knight. He's done all kinds of things. But here he is degrading his achievements in front of everybody to show his own humility. So this is sort of a, a primer on how a knight should act. We've seen him acting with honor to, towards his king. We've seen him acting with courtesy uh, towards the queen. We're seeing him act with humility. Um, and we're also seeing him act with courage in taking up this challenge. So a lot of those knightly virtues are shining forth in Gawain's first speech. Anyway, 
He says, I'm the slightest, the dullest of them all. My life, at least my death, no loss. My only worth is you, my royal uncle. All my virtue is through you. Well, at this point, Sir Gawain, you know, is, is sort of the heir to the throne if King Arthur were to die. So he could just not do anything here and hope Arthur loses and dies and inherit the throne. But instead, he's stepping forward as a good nephew to protect the throne, to protect his uncle. Um, and this foolish business fits my station, not yours. So then he asks everybody if he's at fault. And they... they don't think so. They agree. They say, let, let Gawain take this challenge. Then Arthur ordered his knight to rise, and Gawain rose and came quickly to the king and kneeled and accepted the green man's axe as Arthur yielded it, lifting his hands to bring God to Gawain, commanding that heart and hand must be steady and strong. Be careful, cousin, said the king, to strike but once, offer exactly what he asks, and his stroke will be easier to stand. So King Arthur essentially offers advice to Gawain. He's like, hey, um, you do this right, he ain't getting up. Right, just cut his head off clean, and he's not going to be able to do anything to you. Um, axe in hand, Gawain approached the green man, who waited patient, calm, unmoving. Then he spoke to the knight. Before we proceed, friend, we ought to make everything clear. And I ask you first your name. Speak it openly, and speak the truth. In truth, it is Gawain who offers a stroke and agrees, no matter what happens, to accept a stroke from you in exactly a year with whatever weapon you choose, from you and only from you. The green man smiled. Sir Gawain, no one could do what you'll do and delight me more. No man alive. By God, he swore. Sir Gawain, I'm glad to have what I wanted at your hands. You've spoken our bargain beautifully and spoken it fair and omitted nothing I asked the king, except, knight, your word to seek me yourself, to come to me there where I am at home on earth, and to take the same reward you'll give to me today in this court. So he amends the deal a little bit. He says, you know, Gawain, I'm gonna, I came to your castle so that you could swing at me. You've got to come to my castle so I can swing at you. So, you know, we're setting up a quest here. We're setting up something for Sir Gawain. Um, and as a reader, as somebody who's familiar with medieval romance, um, you should understand that. Of course, Gawain doesn't know where the Green Knight lives. And so he asked the, the obvious question, and where will you be? Asked Gawain. Where's your home? By God, I've never heard of your castle, or you, or your court. Or your name. Tell me, teach me, give me your name, and I'll come to you however hard the road. Wherever you are, I swear on my word. That's enough oath for Christmas, said the green man. I need no more. Once you've swung my axe neatly and well, there'll be time to tell you where my home is and my house and to tell you my name, and you'll test my castle and me and keep your word. And perhaps I'll say nothing once you've struck, which is better for you. You could stay here with your king and not hunt my door. But stop. Take my good axe and show me a chop. Exactly as you ask, said Gawain, ready to strop. Still smiling, the green man bowed and bent his head a bit, baring his neck, his lovely long hair tossed back, leaving the naked flesh open, exposed. Gawain hefted the axe, swung it high in both hands, balancing his left foot in front of him, then quickly brought it down. The blade cut through bones and skin and fair white flesh, split the green man's neck so swiftly that its edge slashed the ground, and the head fell to the earth, rolled on the floor, and the knights kicked it with their feet. That's pretty gross. So he chops the green knight's head clean off, and it starts, like, rolling around, and they, they like, kick it. That's sort of disrespectful. The body spurted blood, gleaming red on green skin. Hey, Christmas colors. Um, but the green man stood a moment, not staggering, not falling, then sprang on strong legs and roughly reached through the thrashing feet, claimed his lovely head, and carrying it to his horse, caught the bridle, stepped in the stirrups and mounted, holding his head by its long green hair, sitting high and steady in the saddle as though nothing had happened. All right, so we're like, uh-oh. Um, his body is not dead. It reaches through the thrashing feet and picks up the severed head. Um, you know, if you're a goblin, how are you reacting to this? What are you thinking about? Um, but he sat there 
headless for everyone to see, twisting his bloody severed stump. Now that's a really unfortunate image. Like the neck is still moving, like it's turning and it's like oozing blood everywhere. Um, and the knights were wary, afraid before he ever opened that mouth to speak. And he held the head high, slowly turning its face toward Arthur and the noblest of his knights. And it lifted its lids and stared with wide eyes. Can you imagine that? Like it turns and it's like eyes are closed and all of a sudden it's like, you know, like the severed head opens its eyes and it moved its lips and spoke saying, Gawain, be ready to ride as you promised. Hunt me well until you find me as you swore to here in this hall, heard by these knights, find the green chapel. Come to take what you've been, what you're given, a quick and proper greeting for a new year's day. Many men know the knight of the green chapel. Seek me and nothing can keep you from me. Then come or be called a coward forever. With a violent rush, he turned the reins and galloped from the hall, his head in his hands. His horse's hooves struck fire on the stone, and where he rode to, no one knew, no more than they'd known from where he came. And then Arthur and Gawain grinned at the joke and laughed as the green at the green man, though those who had seen him knew miracles had been sent. Pause. So this green man, you remember Gawain said, um, I promise no matter what, um, no matter what, that you know he's going to going to accept the stroke from the green man well now you know he's he's cut the green knight's head off but he's still alive and so gawain is honor bound because he said in front of the knights to to go and find him and so this becomes very clearly a test of courage sir gawain has a quest and this is the worst quest that a human being can ever have he's got to go find this green chapel um and then the Green Knight, but he's not going to be able to fight the Green Knight. No, he's got to kneel down um, without armor on and let the Green Knight chop his head off. That is the end of his quest. And so does he have the courage? Does he have the honor to keep his word to this knight to go and face an imminent death at the end of a year? You know, the death clock has just started on Sir Gawain and, and he's got one year to live. Um, and if his quest is successful, he ensures his own death. This is something that, that Beowulf never had to face, something new and different. Um, and one of the things that sets the story apart in literature from, from other stories. Um, but then Gawain and Arthur look at each other and laugh at this. It seems sort of out of character until you realize that they're not laughing like, ha ha, that was funny. They're laughing like we do at things that are, are disturbing and, and strange. You know, when something so unfortunate happens that you can't help but laugh at it. You know, like there's a whole set of humor based on this, like dead baby jokes and things like that. They're not funny. They're just so horrifying that, that at the end of them, you, you have no physical response to give them except laughter. And so, um, you know, Arthur and Gawain look at each other and they're like, <laughs> you know, like what, what else can you do? Um, it's interesting, though. Uh, you know, this Green Knight vanishes after saying this and so Gawain's on a quest to go and find the chapel and get his head chopped off and and um you know the intensity of it all all right last little bit of the chapter and then we'll call it done um Arthur's heart whirled in wonder yet he showed nothing turned to his beautiful queen and spoke courteously but loud my love let nothing of this disturb you these are things right and proper for Christmas and for courtly ladies and their knights miming and plays carols and laughter but now i can dine i admit it the marvel i awaited had come so king arthur you know he's like don't worry about it my wife it's very christmasy you saw the christmas colors red and green aha you know uh, so he's courteous to his wife but then he's like oh and by the way now we can eat because remember the various elements you had to tell a story which didn't happen or go off on a quest. Ah, Sir Gawain is engaged on a quest or have a combat to the death. Oh, we had that too. So we had the things necessary for Arthur to eat. Um, let's see. Um, then he glanced toward Gawain. Sir, he said slowly, hang up your axe. It is cut enough for one night. And the servants hung it high against a tapestry, a trophy for everyone to stare at true evidence of marvelous things. The knights and ladies returned to table and Arthur and Gawain, and good men served them double portions as rank demanded. They ate and drank and listened and watched. And the day was delight and was long and was finally done. And now, Gawain, think. Danger is yours to overcome. And this game brings you danger. Can the game be won? 
good question. Interesting how we shift sort of almost into the second person. It's like the narrator is asking you, the reader, can the game be won? Uh, and that's something to think about here. I mean, we've got this death clock started on Sir Gawain, and is his honor more important than his life? This is a question that's, that's you know, something we should definitely consider. Uh, and, and is honor more important than, than living? Maybe that's something the author's asking about the code of chivalry. Um, and we'll have to consider that. But also, you know, like this, this guy clearly cheated. He had magic. He knew he wasn't going to die. Sir Gawain kneels and gets his head chopped off. He is going to die. Uh, is there a way to win this game? Can you beat the Green Knight at this game that, that has been engaged? Or is it a, a, a foregone conclusion? So I'm going to ask you that question. Let's quick reaction this. Can the game be won? Um, and let's think about the Green Knight. Has the Green Knight, um, as an opponent... Uh, how is he different than the opponents that, say, Beowulf faced? Uh, and, and I'll get your answers to those. Thanks.